afternoon, everyone. I'm Katherine Schaefer, a reporter at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Precision Public Health in the Era of AI and Big Data, and it is sponsored by Sapio Sciences. Our speakers are Joanne M. Hackett, Vice President of Genomic and Precision Medicine at IQVIA, and Aaron Schooler, Senior Manager for Presales at Sapio Sciences. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar presentation. If you look to the bottom tray of your window, there are a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. With that, I'll turn it over to Joanne. Great, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you who have joined us today. I'm delighted to be able to get to speak about a subject that's quite near and dear to my heart. And it's one about public health, precision medicine, genomics, a variety of different things, if you will. And the reason that I have chosen to speak about this and to think about it in the era, if you will, of AI and big data is the fact that we are still at the stage where we say precision medicine is the future. And I would argue that it's actually here and it's just potentially not necessarily recognized as being ready to be extrapolated in a variety of different ways. And in the era of AI and big data, this is something that I believe we need to think about helping our life science clients or our health systems understand a little bit differently if we really are going to maximize the value of precision medicine and the way that it can help a lot of health systems especially in the time now where many health systems are struggling to try to meet need. So I'll walk you through a few different ways that we've been thinking about this at IQVIA and how, with any luck, this will resonate with yourselves and some of the clients that you possibly work with as well. And precision medicine, as, as silly as it sounds, it matters significantly for a lot of the, the right reasons and also some of the reasons that we don't necessarily think about on a regular basis. It's been a long time since people originally thought that precision medicine was something that was very elite or the sort of thing that was perhaps about cloning body parts or having a bunch of stuff ready in case something went wrong. Luckily, we have moved on from that way of thinking. And now it's a bit more about how we can make the correct decisions, doing it faster, smarter, cheaper, and thinking of it really as almost a triage process more than anything else. So if individuals shouldn't be taking particular medications, how are we smarter about enabling those decisions to be made faster? Really and truly, precision medicine can in improve patient quality of life and not even just for individuals who are sick today. And this is why I often say with precision medicine comes the benefit of precision public health because it's the overall recovery, wellness, well-being, and most importantly, prevention. So I'll walk you through a couple of the different ways in which we're thinking about identifying ways to help support uh, smarter, faster, even cheaper ways of doing precision medicine as a whole. Ultimately, we want to prevent treatment failure. We want to make sure that individuals are going to be responding so there's no adverse drug reactions. And ultimately, for a health system as a whole, as many unnecessary procedures as possible, trying to be as efficient as we possibly can. So it really comes down to three main areas. It's thinking about the prevention agenda as a whole. Ultimately, when we think about trying to make sure that individuals are going to get, uh, that are not going to get sick, nobody wants to think about treating them yet. We want to think firstly about not getting sick in the first place. And very often, a, a huge part of that is understanding the risk assessment. So is someone at higher risk of being ill because of the way their lifestyle is, their genetic factors and various things like that? There are ways that we can use genomics and precision medicine to help make that risk assessment. In addition to that, if we're trying to think about how we triage patients differently, then when we think about probabilities and risk scores, this can also help us to get individuals treated in the right way. So ultimately, preventing disease is, is the number one thing. But secondly, if people do get ill, how do we think about diagnosing them faster, 
cheaper and finding out what the, the cause of the disease actually is as well. And the whole diagnostic landscape in this space has really taken off in the last couple of years. And a huge part of that is the fact that we had to be a lot more creative in the way that we found individuals, treated them and various things like that. But also it's come from a push from the patient perspective as well. Does someone really need to come into a, a complex tertiary center in order to be treated? And if the answer is no, how can we be smarter about the, diagno the diagnostic uh, sessions that we do in pharmacies or in the community and things like that? So it's, it's bringing that precise aspect into it as well. And then finally with treatment. Ideally, we want to make sure that individuals, if they do get sick and if we diagnose them quickly, the faster that they can get treated, the more effective it is and the more suitable it is for them. So it's really and truly putting these three different buckets together to think about the preventative medicine angle, the angle around precision medicine, and ultimately about precision public health. And when you think about genomics data across the healthcare ecosystem, it comes down to the different use cases and the impact that can be made. So when I mentioned that we're trying to understand disease, disease insights are extremely important for us to understand novel genes, variants that are linked to disease, for example. It can help with epidemiolo epidemiological studies, understanding the population level incidence of known variants as well. And when you think about how this could possibly in impact the system, if you understand population level disease risk, this helps to inform healthcare policy. And while that may not be something that you're currently doing in your day job today, this really does have a massive impact on perhaps your clients or your clients' clients. So thinking about the aspect of the disease insights and the genomics data's role in that is a huge part of this. When we think about drug discovery, having new drug targets is extremely important and also repurposing existing drugs. It's very rare that a drug that has been created cannot be effective for something. Is it the right amount of drug that has been given? Is it the right person? And perhaps the answer is no to both of those. So how can we be smarter about repurposing existing compounds as well? And this really helps with contributing to the genomic research ecosystem. And with the genomic research ecosystem, we can't do this all in one particular company or in one particular country. So these disease insights are extremely important for the drug discovery aspect of research as well. And that also helps to inform then clinical trial design and interpretation of the trial results. And again, this is a hugely important aspect because you really want to try to attract clinical trials to the country, perhaps that you're living in in particular, because this allows the trial to be, to be delivered in the, in the country, which then very often allows for the drug to be reimbursed. So there is a direct link between attracting that clinical trial and then the delivery. And the healthcare delivery as a whole is not just necessarily having access to new drugs and new treatments. It's also about identifying the likelihood of positive responses to these treatments. And this is where pharmacogenomics plays a huge role as well. And overall, this can help hugely with patient outcomes, leading to decreased pressure on the healthcare system as a whole, which in turn leads to cost savings. And a couple of examples here to think about how we can look at pharmacogenomics or polygenic risk scores, for example, and the impact on public health. So in the UK where I'm based, Avoidable adverse drug reactions, they're estimated to cost our healthcare system 530 million pounds annually in hospital admissions. That's a pretty big number. And if 16.5% of these admissions are due to adverse drug reactions, are we not potentially going about this in the wrong way? If we think about informing prescription decisions based on the understanding of a pharmacogenomic impact, would this be a smarter way of delivering the medication before we cost the healthcare system a huge amount in adverse drug reactions and hospital readmissions? And most importantly, why aren't we giving the individual the right, deci the, the right decision for the right medication the first time? So can we flip this? Can we think a little bit more about prevention? And so they're just you know, small things to think about here because they can have a maximum impact as well. 
The other thing is polygenic risk scores. When you look at some of the modeling to suggest that large scale implementation could lead to significant reduction in the number of cardiovascular events, how do we implement those into disease registries, for example? Can this help with screening and management and treatment? Triage essentially is what it is. This can indicate the high risk patients and you combine that polygenic risk score with the existing risk methodology that's currently used. Again, a very small way of implementing a precision medicine approach to impact public as a whole. And to just put some numbers on this, when we looked at the economic case for bringing this into primary care in particular, so using pharmacogenomics to indicate the potential benefit, it's up to about 4.5 billion pounds in the UK for a year. Again, can we take that money and start to think a little bit more creatively about applying this type of rationale to the prevention agenda and being a little bit more precise when it comes to maximizing individuals as a whole, whether or not they're sick today or whether it's preventing them to get, from getting sick or preventing them from coming back into the hospital. So there's a huge amount that can be saved in the system, but more importantly, a direct impact on the human being as well. And genomics is often really attributed to the impact it has within rare diseases, which is true. However, there is a greater impact that genomics can have. But highlighting specifically the rare disease aspect, we often talk about it as something that is, is very specialized, is you know very, it's not at all something that is you know, seen on, on a regular basis. While this is sort of true, it's actually a little bit untrue in the sense that there's over 7,000 rare diseases. It's a pretty big number. One in 10 people are affected by rare diseases. So if you go to a gathering of some sort with more than 10 people, there's probably one person there out of every 10. That's quite a, you know, it's a number we can resonate with. When we think about the impact on children, 75% of rare diseases affect children, and 30% of them will actually die before the age of five. So with these quite sobering statistics and knowing that about 80% of them have a genetic origin, how can we think about using genomics as a, as a pivotal way to understand rare diseases and to develop and repurpose drugs that treat them? So if we look at the fact that it's not really all that uh, uncommon, but in fact, it's the treatments that are rare, how can we be a bit more specialized in doing this? And this is where as I mentioned, genomics is a key component to helping rare disease patients. The most important thing is to take the left side, which is the reducing the diagnostic odyssey and marrying it up with the right side, which is accelerating access to treatment and narrowing that gap. And this is where you allow access to the right treatments. It's faster, it's at a better cost as well. I will highlight that a lot of people will often argue that it's actually very expensive, uh, sometimes these drugs are extremely complicated and it's really hard to get them reimbursed and that's not widely accepted. I acknowledge that and yes, that is true. However, if you look at the overall journey and the impact, that upfront cost, in, in, in addition to the fact that you are not just paying for the actual treatment cost, but how the individual is integrating back into society. They can have a job, they can, they can go to work, they can have a sense of purpose. It's broader than just the cost of the treatment. So the upfront cost may look quite eye-watering, but if you actually look at the number of times children in particular go back and forth and through a healthcare system, it can be hundreds of times. There's a cost to that every single time. So thinking a little bit more preventively about enhanced neonatal screening and various things like that can help reduce the cost of that drug as well. And when we think about clinical trials, this is where a, a lot of cost actually gets put into play. So a genetically supported trial, it doubles the success rate. So clearly everybody wants to have, you know, the 10, 12, 15 patients that they're looking for having a fantastic outcome. That will help clearly get the drug approved and most importantly to the right people. So helping that criteria definition, finding the right patient, so building the right cohort, this helps with finding the patient, speeding that up as fast as possible, which is a huge cost and into the whole clinical development pipeline. And most importantly, if they're going to respond, that's the outcome that we're all looking for. 
just want to highlight a use case here to show the actual impact of this in, in real life. So prior to my role at IQV, I was at Genomics England. And for those of you who are aware of Genomics England, it effectively was one of the first national genomics programs to come up with the idea of thinking about offering whole genome sequencing to individuals with suspected rare diseases and certain forms of cancer. The whole intention was if there was a health economics proposal that allowed this to be seen as something that is quite unique and useful to the healthcare system, it would be widely adopted. So fast forward 10 years later, and in, at the, in the UK, free at the point of care, a whole genome sequence can be ordered for children, for, for individuals with suspected rare diseases. So a very successful pilot. It's great to have a database of genomes, but more importantly, doing something with it is extremely important as well. And in this particular instance, there was a clinical trial that was looking for, it was an ultra rare disease, and it had to be a very, very small sample size, mostly based on the fact that it's quite hard to find these individuals. And by screening through 100,000 genomes in one particular country, in one particular registry, filtering it out, one individual was able to recruit it into a trial site. And this is great, don't get me wrong, but many countries that are trying to do these sorts of programs fail to realize that the data set is just not going to be big enough and is certainly not going to be diverse enough for every type of disease or disorder that someone is trying to do a trial on. And that's why it's so important for us to think about the broader ecosystem around the patient. I'm a geneticist, I love a good genome, don't get me wrong, but that's just another data point. We need to think about other aspects of data points that we can, that we can bring together to understand that comprehensive view of the patient. So it's great to have the genome sequence, it's great to have the clinical notes, combining them together to be able to understand that is great. Can we then add lab data? Can we then add anything else that we can possibly get our hands onto? Is temperature important? I don't know. If we have access to that, can we somehow bring it into the system? It's that whole uh, component around the individual that's important as well. Can we start to draw conclusions about individuals that live in certain parts of the world or live close to train tracks, for example, or things like that, we can only start to understand triggers or the way individuals respond, the more data that we have. So thinking about that broader ecosystem is a huge component as well. And this is why I spend a lot of time trying to explain that it's great to have all of these data points and it's great that they're being collected. But if you have some ability to be able to link these data sources together or to advise folks that you either are working with or clients of yours, this is where we start to actually enable new capabilities, allow new relevant classifications, some predictive disease modeling to happen as well. It really is quite useless to have a lot of this data in isolation, so you could almost argue why bother even collecting it. So again, when we're thinking creatively about increasing data value and being able to do the really interesting research and clinical development, it's being able to pull these data sources together to be able to help us to make that next level of insight. And we can really only do this globally. There is certainly not one country that can do this on its own, definitely not big enough numbers and certainly not diverse enough either. And onto the, this and looking at it from a slightly more global perspective, there was a white paper that we did a couple of years ago to look at the number of genomic sequencing initiatives that are integrating genomics data with high quality clinical data. And disappointingly, it's quite low. Uh, there's a lot of initiatives, almost 200 initiatives uh, a couple of years ago. But you can see from this graph that the proportion of initiatives that were planning on linking the genomics data to any sort of patient or participant data, clinical data, it's, it's actually quite, quite low. And unfortunately, we, we have spent a lot of time in the genomics space thinking about the big, shiny, fancy, expensive machine, and less so about how we're going to derive insights from that. And you'll hear shortly how it's important to have the right tools to be able to interrogate the data, make 
it's structured, be able to look for predictions and being able to do a variety of different things. I won't spoil that point of the presentation yet, but bear in mind, this is exactly the sort of thing that we need to be putting budget aside for. Otherwise, we're really not maximizing the value of some of these different data sources. And as I mentioned, one of the things that we need to really think about is these different data platforms that exist. They are not always able to be communicating with each other and only thinking about ways to pool data and to be able to interrogate it. Can we unlock the full power of the genomic and precision medicine data points for these patients? We shouldn't overlook the, the fact that patient generated data is extremely useful, extremely important. A patient knows better about themselves and they can explain a lot more about the side effects or how they're feeling and whether or not they can help contribute to either more real world data or different uh, samples, for example. And all of this is extremely important for us to remember based on the fact that it's the ecosystem of the individual, not just one component data point. There was a fantastic piece of work done a couple of years ago to help measure the number of seizures and the, how severe these tremors were for individuals who were taking certain types of treatment. They were children primarily, and it was very challenging for the parents to report this because the children were not sleeping in the same bed as them, and the children couldn't report it because they were sleeping. So underlocking some components about patient-generated outcomes is hugely valued now, when especially we've got so many opportunities with artificial intelligence, looking at different ways of digital health. So all, all of that is coming together. And the one thing I will underpin here is by saying that we all actually are patients at the end of the day. We may not be suffering from a common complex disorder or a disease per se, but we all know what it feels like when we're sick and we all know how good it feels when we start to feel better. So don't underestimate the power of yourself in the patient perspective when it comes to this. And I mentioned with respect to patients as a whole, any sort of patient-led data collaborations are the ones that allow us to gain more access to a variety of different data sources. But also these registry platforms, for example, are great ways to be able to capitalize on some of the research that is needed. So again, how do we combine some of these different registries from around the world? There's clear, there's creative ways of doing that as well. It may not all be in the same institution. So again, you'll hear shortly from Aaron about some of the ways that Sapio is able to combine different data sources and have some of these insights as well. And I mentioned the real world data evidence side of things. And this is something that sometimes people grapple with a little bit because I'm not entirely sure what does this really mean? So the secondary data that exists already, how can we start to understand the value of that? We're getting more and more submissions to the regulatory bodies for evidence-driven initiatives. This helps with the mission, helps with objectives, for example, so national audits and things like that. But we're seeing it more now coming in as supplementary ways to understand whether or not a full clinical trial needs to be run. Is there ways to be able to predict the response rate for individuals that have fast progressing MS and various things like that? So traditional research platforms do exist in ways that we can harness these patients, the, the, the existing data collections and allow us to derive those insights as well. And then finally, what I mentioned, genomics and precision medicine, the power of genomics, again, to patient organizations as a whole this does help accelerate research and access the precision medicine for patients as a whole. So again, how do we start to tap into new and different ways? Is it repurposing compounds? Is it new novel therapeutics that need to find a, a whole group of individuals to do a trial on? You can only really start to maximize that when we start to combine a variety of different data sources from around the world. And so I've spent a little bit of time talking about federation and linkage for the, the reason that it is extremely important. And as I said, unfortunately, this is the, the last thing we end up putting money into our budgets for or into our, our research grant or various things like that. It's because it's the thing that's rather difficult to see sometimes. But I urge you to think about the, the three things that most people are trying to achieve in this space, anything to do with better research, 
optimizing trial design, improving care delivery, the thought of being able to link different data sources, extrapolate the data that's necessary, and to do it in, a, in an easy manner that's not complicated, that's going to give you the exact data points that you need. There are tools that exist. And as I said, Aaron's going to speak shortly about this. The reason I urge this is mostly based on the fact that we do have a lot of individuals that are building data sets. They've put a lot of effort into this. They think these data sets are extremely valuable. On their own, they're rarely valuable. And they're, they're usually extremely disappointed to hear this because the you know maybe it's a thousand patients or maybe it's a thousand samples. It sounds like a very attractive number, but ultimately on its own or not being able to derive value or it not being either enough long, longitudinality in the data or not diverse enough, it's not really actually all that valuable. So unless you unlock the, the research aspect of it, there's very little that can be done with the, the, the massive data set that's been assembled as well. So I urge you to think about that slightly outside of the box because it's not going to be one small company, one large company, one government that's going to be able to do this on their own. There needs to be collaboration and there needs to be tools that can go across these different systems as well. And also the regulatory environment is changing rapidly. Even the legal environment, especially when you're starting to think about the minute you put together an algorithm, it's almost non-existent or not even useful by the time you actually get access to more data. So do we try to protect these things or do we? Or can we protect them? So the, this environment is changing quickly as well. So if we're thinking about interconnectivity and standardization, you'll need to think of a platform that's going to scale and be able to scale globally as well. And you'll need to be able to have something that has common data standards and a technology platform that's going to be able to be useful for all sorts of individuals. So the ease of access is important, but also needing to be able to think about having a sandbox environment that you can do whatever you want as well. So there's going to be very, very proficient users and also individuals that don't have a lot of a skill set. So again, thinking about the ways that you can maximize tools and technologies to do that is a, a huge component of this as well. And then I do, again, I just want to highlight the, the power of the patient and the citizen as a whole. We all are patients, as I said, at the end of the day. So I just wanted to, to spend a couple of minutes on this uh, as I finish. And the reason I think this is such an important aspect for us to think about is because the insights that are generated are usually unique. This helps massively in this whole era of AI, big data, understanding things differently. If I was to look at a hundred different charts and to try to understand if there was a pattern, it would take me a really long time to do that. We're getting to the point now where we're in an environment where a lot of tools and technologies can help us improve patient care faster. If I was to be able to look at a longitudinal data set and understand that 50% of people who had acne also had miscarriages, also had early onset MS, how can we then start to triage those patients faster so that they get the treatments that they need earlier in their life so they don't have early onset MS, they don't get those symptoms ever in their lifetime. And being able to harness that is really the way that healthcare is changing. We keep talking about prevention, but there are some things we just simply can't prevent because they're genetic. So how do we use machine learning and artificial intelligence technologies to do this differently? And this is where I think there's huge opportunities in this space to be able to connect those data points, find the right data points, make those insights and bring together us. We are all patients at the end of the day because we're, cr we're crucial to build up this capacity that's necessary to understand what is actually happening. So with that, I hope I've been able to bring a little bit of attention into the disparate data sources that exist, the need to think about pulling them together in a slightly different way, the, the ability and the opportunity to, for us to be able to think about engaging with life science sector differently, the health systems sector differently, and more importantly, how can we, if we are in a position to influence some of these decisions, can we be smarter about prevention? Can we be smarter about implementing tools so that if people, if, if, so that people don't get sick, and if they do get sick, let's diagnose them faster, and then most importantly, 
how can we treat them most efficiently as well. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Erin, who will walk you through some of the very exciting aspects that Sapio have on offer as well. Thank you. thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Joanne. That was great. So that really sets the stage to the idea that we're trying to convey here is that Sapio has the set of tools to accomplish just that and also really track your large data sets and apply AI to it as well. So with that said, I'm going to dive right into conquering this large data set, right? How do we do so? What tools do you probably need? And we've been around for a while, Sapio has, and we've really conquered this um, through our platform-centric uh, approach and our software here. So I'm going to spend a few minutes first introducing you to Sapio Sciences in general and our LIMS, ELN, and SDMS uh, platform here. I'm going to reiterate a little bit the uh, idea of tackling this data problem, and then I'm going to introduce two new tools, really, that make this all work, Jarvis and Elaine. So let's first take a look at our core, Sapio Sciences. We have this idea of the platform providing a triple play approach all within an actual platform. And we're one of the few companies in the entire world, really, that can call ourselves a true platform, honestly, because what we define that as is you can build anything on this platform. It just so happens we built a platform first, and now we're establishing the LIMS, ELN, and SDMS on top of it, on top of Jarvis and also additional Elaine functionality, which we'll get to shortly. But the idea here is that you have a single experience the pre-built workflows even that come out, science-aware applications that um, fulfill a lot of needs. Oh, sorry, my slides are going a little crazy here. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, but we really took a no-code or low-code approach to this to where everything is configurable within applications so that you can actually adhere to your specific lab needs in the application. And then we pile on top these science-aware applications or widgets that allow you to do things like compound management and synthesis, reactions, uh, CRISPR, Flow Cyto, a, a whole slew of mobile tools is the idea. So with that said, this is our platform. The Sapio platform has a common data core that you can then utilize for ELN needs, LIMS needs, or SDMS needs. So you can take this program, this solution, and apply it across an entire organization if you needed to. Everything is centralized, your data, it's visualizable, you can analyze it, and it's all very well organized and easily searchable through a targeted fashion. But let's be real, whenever we created this solution, we wanted to expand and spread Sapio across your entire organization, so the large pharmas of the world. But that information is not so tidy. There's a lot of fiefdoms throughout the organization that have their own limbs. You establish a new lab, and now you're saying, okay, I want to use limbs A versus limbs B or ELNC and so on and so forth. So you end up with a slew of applications across your organization and, of course, a whole large amount of instruments that you need to integrate with. And what you end up with is this interconnectivity that the data is just all over the place, right? Integration also, in general, will take a lot of time, it's time consuming, very costly. So the data ends up siloed and isn't harmonized. So we came back and said, okay, because we cannot spread Sapio across an entire organization because of these fiefdoms, maybe there's some kind of intermediate solution that is also science aware. So with the scientific cloud transitions, a lot of companies have established data lake like solutions that kind of end up looking like this. So, okay, you do have some middleware, your interconnectivity is a little less spread out, but in reality, the data is still hard to find. In fact, you don't wanna go and try to make a ticket to your IT um, uh, person in order to get data out, for example. You want the scientists to be able to actually go in and produce searches that retrieve this information and that they can actually view and navigate said data. Well, Sapio by itself will accomplish that. However, what happens when you have all of these alternative solutions and instruments that you need to inter interconnect? Well, that's why we introduced Jarvis, which I guess you can say is just a rather very intelligent system, not just another da data lake is the point here. So your data is all collected in a centralized location and gains context. It has meaning. 
right? So as your instrument data is collected and parsed or ETL'd, extracted, transformed, and loaded, we create structured data that's associated with your samples, experiments, and anything else really contextually that is associated or needs to be associated with that data. And it makes a data set that is AI ready, which we believe truly is the future of Sapio and the scientific field in general is making data AI ready. And then what I mean by scientific awareness, as far as it goes with Jarvis or Sapio in general, means scientists can actually log in and utilize the system. That means that instead of trying to figure out SQL code to retrieve data or relying on an IT individual to retrieve said data and provide it in some CSV that may or may not be relevant, it's all in a single system that is searchable. You can navigate through the system through a knowledge graph and see what projects are related, what instruments, what data is loaded, et cetera, all searchable and targetable as well. Now, the beauty of this Jarvis system and Sapio in general is also that you can visualize your scientific data, whether it's compounds, proteins, plasmids, et cetera. We have visualizations that the scientists can actually dive into and make sense of. So it's not just data, it's actually interpreting that data in a digestible form for the scientists. And then, like I've stated before, the idea that all this data is together makes it very, very AI-centric, right? So let's take a brief look at the Jarvis data flow here. So you've got a set of instruments across your organization. You probably have a set of ELN and LIMS across your organization as well. So we want to collect all that information to a centralized location. From there, you can contextualize. You can build it in a hierarchical representation and knowledge graph, so to speak, so that you can easily traverse it. And then you can send even updates or other information back to the ELN and LIMS that you've synchronized with Jarvis so that you can always achieve the most up-to-date data and have a source of truth. But then, of course, the scientists can come in and explore that data. They can analyze it in the product itself and learn for, further from it and rinse and repeat, right? So you're collecting the new learned data, you're sending it back as needed, or you're sending it forward to progress even further through your development. So let's talk a little bit about how we connect with instruments. So Sapio has for many years now been uh, the, our bread and butter, so to speak, about instrument connectivity here. Jarvis expands that even further by providing 200 common parsers across very common instruments in your lab. And then, of course, you can expand this like you would expect with the platform with new parsers to expand your instrument list, right? And then even if you don't have an instrument that's recognized through these file watchers that are pulling in data, you can still pull in those files and index them so that they're at least searchable to some degree and you have them collected in a centralized location. And then of course, we're very well versed in, in connecting directly to APIs, not just file exchange. So a lot of times you're sending out instruction files and collecting output raw data from instruments. We can also connect directly through API, such as Empower, Chameleon, et cetera. So yeah, I mean, we're well known over the years for being experienced working with that integration piece of this. And we've just expanded that to a centralized Jarvis solution, essentially. So again, let's pay attention closer to the scientific awareness in general here. So the idea being that, yes, you've collected all your scientific data in one truly scientific system is the point here. So you can browse all of your ELN limbs data, all of your instruments, and everything all hierarchically linked in a knowledge graph. As you can see in the visual on the right-hand side here, this is your actual knowledge graph, um, the tree that you see on the left. And then from that data being collected in one place, you can create all sorts of graphs, whether it's KPIs or just general information from the collection of um, uh, instrument data for your proteins or samples in general that can all be visualized very easily through in-app configuration. You can also add any new data type or even enhance existing data types to collect the data that you're pulling in. So it's very easy in app, again, to go in and essentially say, oh, I need this additional data. Let's add those fields accordingly. And then to my point, configurable, configurable dashboards is kind of the real highlight here that goes overlooked oftentimes. You want to be able to log into a system and immediately glance what you need to see as a user in any system. So Sapio and Jarvis provides just that. Uh, very intentional because 
our goal all this time has really been to accelerate the growth of drug discovery and otherwise. And so we want you to be able to log in, see what you need to see, and make decisions accordingly. So just an idea here, this is actually in the application where any of the data that you collect is linked, right? So you can search across the entire hierarchy accordingly um, as such. And this is a visual, visualization that we provide in application to actually see that data in that format. So you can see what derived from what. In a very classic sense, let's say uh, next-gen sequencing, you can say, okay, I brought in blood, I've extracted DNA, so that's now a child sample that's associated to that DNA parent. Sorry. Um, and then have out linkages to anything else that's associated to this, whether it's even a plate or um, other materials that went into this or the experiment it was in. You can visualize all of this very easily. So again, expanding upon scientific awareness, you can visualize all of your scientific entities, such as plasmids, proteins, compounds, et cetera. Those tools are built into Jarvis appropriately. In other words, this really uh, allows the scientists to come in, search for a plasmid and visualize it as needed, and then even export it or synchronize with external systems. We also have very uh, easy no-code search and chart building. So any set of data that you have in the system, you can search upon it and then uh, build your own custom query and then result in a table of data. Well, the table of data can be exported or you can build charts upon it and visualize it directly on the fly, actually, in the product itself. So this is really powerful stuff that's always got us very popular on the Sapio limbs and ELN side. Well, guess what? Of course, that translates to a Jarvis as well, given the platform capabilities. Of course, we also have integrated analytics. So anything that you can uh, anticipate, which is also extendable, you can also um, apply your own analytics or reach out to a third party analytics and get the results back in. But we have a lot of those built in in place, including a flow, flow cytometry, for example, curve fitting, all of what you would normally expect here. On the flow cyto side, we even have auto gating. So you can apply AI to build your own gates um, automatically. So the main point here that I'm getting at is this is very AI centric and that's really the future of Sapio, but also we believe the scientific discovery realm. So we are really focusing right now because the platform has been so solidified and perfected over the years that we're now really trying to focus on, okay, what scientific domains can we expand to, but also how can we fit AI into this equation? which is super important here. We're basically allowing you to, in the product, ask the product questions or give it direction and produce it through natural language. Instead of you having to click and point and do all this other stuff, we're saying, no, natural language is certainly the future and that's the direction we wanna go. So we've been working very, very large, uh, heavily on this with uh, large language models, for example, and training it on our own API as well. You can see here in the top right image, we call this product Elaine. So I'll get more into that in just a second. So Elaine, what does that stand for? Electronic Laboratory Artificially Intelligent Notebook. So with Sapio and Jarvis, you get an ELN, but how can you interact with it effectively using AI? So we feel that we will lead in this effort as Sapio. We got ahead of the game. We've already done it. Elaine is out now, and it's only going to get better. So like I said, the future is natural language, whether it's text or your voice. We feel that you can dictate to a product and achieve what you need as a scientist. So Elaine will be your scientific assistant. So here's a few examples of some prompts that you could potentially use even now um, to modify your ELN. You can say, okay, show me all DNA samples I created this year. Behind the scenes, this is looking at, it's very complicated. It's looking and saying like, okay, I, what does I mean? As simple as that sounds, it's saying, okay, the current user logged in. We track all of that. We audit any creation, modification, et cetera, to the product. So it will look into this and say, okay, samples of type DNA that I created this year, how do I find that? And it figures it out. <laughs> It's quite amazing. 
So you can also like set up new experiments in the ELN or limbs. You can say, create a plate with eight cell line samples diluted three times for six replicates with controls in A11 and A12. Just by stating this, it will then launch you into a new experiment in the product that has a plate designer that has those samples laid out in the replication that you've um, actually requested. And then on top of this, you know, Sabio has always taken a low code, no code uh, approach to the product. So we have a lot of built-in actions and capabilities that don't require you to extend it with code at all. But sometimes maybe you have something proprietary that you need um, code to inject or um, interject and, and do something very custom, right? Well, we also have trained our AI models to generate code automatically based on the API that we provide. So you can say, create Python code to create an experiment and add eight DNA samples to an entry in it. And this would automatically then establish a new experiment with exactly that, um, or I'm sorry, the code that would lead to being able to create that experiment. You can then copy and paste that code into whatever you know, IDE that you need to and produce whatever you need in addition to it. You can test it, you can modify it, et cetera, but this is going to definitely be um, a very useful tool for the developers in general. So what can Elaine do now? We're talking about our current AI functionality. And by the way, in addition to that, it will only learn and get better over time. That's the beauty of AI, right? But let's start talking about the Sapio support agent here. So essentially, we have a good volume of our current training materials, history, documentation, et cetera, that we feed into these models in order to teach our AI or neural networks how to use Sapio. So you can utilize this and actually chat in the system and ask questions um, and it will only get smarter. So this is a few example of this would be like end user training. You know, how do I store samples? Very simple question. It will then dictate a set of instructions for you to do just that. App specific training. So this is like based on any configurations you've made on the system, AI could learn and then also provide you feedback on your own custom workflows. Coding examples, like I said earlier, you can say, okay, give me an example of how to code this plugin to achieve this. That is achievable here as well, and we'll get an actual code set back um, to utilize. And then administrative training too. So this would be like your data model, in-app data model uh, configuration or homepage configuration. How do I add these charts to my homepage? Things like that. So generally, how do I or generate this or that work well as it is right now. And it's only gonna get better over time. So searching, the biggest point of Sapio really has always been to have a point or a central location for all of your data. That's the entire point of Jarvis. Well, you wanna search upon that data and make sense of it, monetize it even, whatever it is. So we already have these strong capabilities to search across the data hierarchies, right? But there's still a learning curve. It's an interface you have to interact with. The scientists have to come in and build a query and everything. Sapio makes it very easy to do that. But how can it even be easier? Through natural language. How beautiful it would be for you to just chat or even speak what you actually want to search for? That would make everything and everyone's life so much better. You know, we have to understand the components of an ask and translate that to a search. But an example of this would be show me all the DNA samples I created this year with tape station molarity greater than five. How does the system know that? Well, luckily we have pre-built and preemptively gone with the idea that everything needs to be structured, right? We import this data, it's gonna be structured data and it's gonna be related hierarchically with whatever it relates to. That would be samples or plates or otherwise in this case. So we can just figure that out because of that preemptive platform discoverability and traceability. So finally, you can also then create new experiments through natural language. A core feature of our ELN, of course, is the ability to create new experiments, whether they're ad hoc or they're based on a template of some sort. That's kind of been the big bread and butter, right? So now plating is often one of those core features as well, where you're saying, okay, I brought these tubes in, now I want to design a plate and apply those samples to this plate to create replicates, maybe apply controls, et cetera. 
but it takes a lot of clicks to set up a plate, no matter what the software solution is. So again, our goal is to use the natural language to create the experiment and auto plate for you as well. We got to handle dilution schemes, what samples to use, associate those with wells, apply templates, etc. There's a lot to this, and we've worked diligently uh, for a while now to really get this going. And we also want to support other entry types. So this is like add a work doc or add materials, add instruments, etc. That is all in the plan for the future of Elaine. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to pass it back over to Catherine here for any questions or otherwise. But thank you for your time today. Thank you, Joanne and Aaron. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. We'd like to ask attendees to take a moment after the webinar has ended to take our exit survey to give us your feedback. We'll now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. The first question is, uh, Um, what do you see as the three main barriers to implementing pharmaco pharmacogenomics into NHS England? Great. Um, I can start with that one. Uh, for, for many different health systems, not just the NHS in the UK, one of the things that is always challenging to grapple with is paying for prevention. We were all very fortunate that someone paid for vaccines a couple of years ago. But aside from vaccines, very little is done in health systems to pay for prevention. So it's cost, unfortunately. And even if it's not a big cost, how, how do you carve out a budget when, generally speaking, the budget cycle is about patient flow much more so than preventing them to come into the hospital in the first case? And if it's not going to sit within a health system, is it more social care? Is it more the community outreach? It's very challenging to define where that budget is. So there's really only one main challenge for health systems about thinking about pharmacogenomics. If they're not going to be able to carve out budget for thinking about the prevention agenda, can they then inform or use other institutions or in existing infrastructure to do that? And pharmacies exist in every part of the world. And very often you could argue that a pharmacist has a closer relationship with an individual more so than their GP. It's very often a long-term relationship. The individual comes in, picking up headache tablets, picking up cold medication for a child, picking up plasters, conversations happen. There's interesting ways to be able to engage individuals in that, in that setting as well. So it may be that there is a, a different model rather than thinking about your traditional way of delivering healthcare. That's something as simple and effective as pharmacogenomics could be integrated into. And the Netherlands have been very good at utilizing pharmacies for exactly that. Yeah, and on the, on the software side, you know, Sapio, we've been global for, for quite a while now, and we've dealt with this. So as we expanded to Europe, we discovered some of those, um, you know, things we have to deal with, so to speak, as far as the um, centralized uh, healthcare goes. And, you know, Scandinavia, for example, was particularly difficult but we've achieved that long ago and, and really passed all the barriers um, to do so. So as far as uh, validation and other things go, um, it's been um, well received on our end. Thanks. Uh, another question, how do you QC the platform and can you please comment on possible errors, hallucinations or other potential risks? So, I mean, we have a very um, rigorous software development life cycle for the product directly. So I'll just say that uh, it goes through um, that. We, it's pre-validated. Uh, you know, we've really been expanding over the last year, honestly, in that regard too, is pre-validation and uh, QC mechanisms um, and procedures in the company to really help facilitate uh, the quality of the product, of course, right? But this is also a tried and true platform that's been around for over 10 years, right? So a lot of that has been solidified long ago. And then we have an actual um, implementation procedure too. So any configurations, you can utilize our services to really customize the system to your specific needs. And we have a whole PMO um, that allows you to have not just business analysts if you need it, but project managers and otherwise to help facilitate the quality of the product as it goes through your specific configurations. 
Um, one thing of no to note with Sapio is that we don't lock anything behind our services. So when you work with our team, we want to train you and teach you and pass the baton so you can easily go back in and understand the configurability of the product and apply your own changes as you see fit internally. You don't ever have to come back to us if you don't need to, but you'll always have us uh, for support. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, another question, what would be the main challenge for implementing AI in pharmacovigilance? Uh, sure, I can start with that one. One of, the, one of the biggest challenges is trying to understand the data that's needed, the quality of the data, is it structured, and whether or not it can be combined. So the longitudinality is, is a huge aspect to this. You have to understand how patients are responding, uh, whether or not there's other factors that are attributed to that as well. So really, it's the, the longitudinal follow-up aspect, which is massively important, but the data can only be, you can only train an algorithm based on the data that it's fed. So if we're missing height and weight, do we actually understand the outcome if we were looking at dosage, for example? So it really is about the quality of the data going in and the longitudinality, in my opinion. That's exactly right. And, you know, Sapio has been training on your very, very robust common models that you'd expect, but we've interjected, so to speak, with our own API and science aware information as well, because AI on its own, you can go to chat GTP and ask a question. It's not very good at, you know, determining scientific decisions um, a lot of the times. So we took that and made the effort to make it scientifically aware so that you can easily then ask science questions and get relevant scientific responses. Um, that's kind of the entire point there. And to Joanne's point, yes, it's based, it's going to be as good as the model that you base it on, which is also a big point as to why Sapio is so extendable. Um, that's kind of our, um, always been our motive, right, is to extend and allow any additional models or otherwise to um, apply to your actual decision making that the system makes. Thank you. Uh, we have a question for Joanne. Gathering a large number of data points from individuals is difficult. Could you make a comment about reducing the number of individuals needed by increasing depth and quality of multiomic data? Yes, and this is where, you know, to the point that I was making previously about trying to understand the, the differences between precision and public health and the intersection, it's great to get as much data as possible to understand the broad, but especially when you're thinking about specific and very, something that's disease specific or disorder specific, you definitely want as much depth as possible. So having a group of 1,000 patients, for example, but understanding proteomics, metabolomics, multiomics as a whole is a huge component. That also does two things. We don't necessarily know what, we're, what, what, what the future holds with respect to tools and technologies for more research development. So having additional samples biobank is a key component of that. So it's great that we have the different omics that we have today, but is there going to be something new in 10 years' time? So I, I would say future-proofing uh, is, is a clear component of this as well, and this is where biobanking comes in. So I would biobank the sample and then definitely go as deep as possible, especially if you've got a cohort, and this is called cohorts or registries, depending on where you come from, but that's definitely what I would uh, advise. All right. Thank you, Joanne. Um, Another question we have, uh, the quality of an AI model depends on the quality of data that has been used to train the model. Does your system have some sort of QC on the data to make it more AI friendly? If so, under which basis does it do it? Yeah, no, so, yeah, definitely um, has that. It's kind of an internal proprietary um, combination of models that then allow us to, of course, apply our own system and API and things to it. Um, I can't really speak much more to it than that. But yes, uh, the answer is definitely yes. We have our own QC internalized uh, for this. Thank you. That's all the time we have for today. We'd like to thank Joanne Hackett and Aaron Schooler and our sponsor, Sapio Sciences. If we didn't have time to get to your question, we'll try to follow up with our experts. As a reminder, please look out for the survey after you log out to provide your feedback. If you missed any part of this webinar or would like to listen to it again, an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar.